I am delighted to have the privilege of introducing the closing keynote speaker for the Diana Initiative Conference 2022, Mickey Demeter. Now, you may know her as a very skilled security researcher currently with Intel, but I think all of us know Mickey as a vibrant voice for women in tech, someone who generously shares their passion and their knowledge with multiple organizations to make a difference. She has been with us from early days, securing and ensuring that this event is a safe and welcoming place for all. When we say, take the initiative, let, let Mickey's passion and commitment light your way. So now, with much joy, I give you Mickey. Oh, oh, oh. That's great. Of course, I trip stepping up onto the stage. I'm brain dead right now. Yes, <laughs> I knew you would do it. <laughs> we couldn't have the music, so they went ahead and did the clapping for Mickey. Um, it's really great to be here to give this closing keynote. It's always been something that I've wanted to do, and I was invited this year, and it's unbelievable because this is the first one since 2019 that I've done live. So let's kind of get on with this. The Diana Initiative, since its inception, right, has been purely to be a diversity-driven conference, right? We're committed to helping underrepresented communities, people, you know, in information security. It's been the platform for many first-time speakers, and most of them this is still one of the most unique events of its type. We earlier got to see Jen Easterly come in and give an absolutely amazing uh, opening keynote where she told us, we really need to work much harder at driving diversity and inclusion into info security because if we don't, we're failing ourselves and we're failing the industry. We also got to hear some great talks by some great people. I got to sit in on part of this talk uh, with Chris, Megan, and Alyssa, where they talked about building your own networks and how expanding your networks makes it so much easier for you to climb corporate ladders, to move along inside the industry, where Chris made a pivot from one industry to another, where Megan, by learning how to network and, and develop those networks, was able to get into the security industry. And of course, hearing about Alyssa, who is one of my heroes, of course, uh, her meteoric rise in the security world, all because of the networking that people do. So, there's going to be a test. I want you all to know this. Okay. I have my little, I'm, I'm a little bit like Jen. I have my little rucksack here with nice little gifts for you all. So who am I? Well, many of you know me as the safety operations for Diane Initiative. I have been doing it since the inception. Um, I've enjoyed this work immensely. Uh, it gives me a chance to be here every year. I get to see all of the new faces. I get to see the people come and go, and I get to see, most of all, people grow. And it's amazing to watch people come in and make that first networking connection, make that first you know, attempt at doing a resume, making that first attempt at sitting through a technical interview. 
And having all of that available here for everybody to come in and do that for the first time in, an, in a very safe and inviting atmosphere is something that you know, has been part of Diana Initiative from the very beginning. But for me, I started my career as an auto mechanic. And so I was an uh, ASE certified master tech and a Nissan master technician. I spent almost 10 years as a technician. And I was injured. And I decided that this was not where I wanted to be when I'm ready to retire with a broken body. And so I made a pivot. I actually became a minimum wage worker at a high tech company that built cables and connectors for medical ultrasound. And my first position there was as a machine operator that put the braiding on coax. And these machines are actually really complex to actually watch as they braid wires and turn it into the metal shielding that you see on a coaxial cable. And they did it on everything from your standard television RG58U type cable all the way down to the smallest, most implantable cable into the body. These machines, I was learning how to take initiative at that time. And I thought, well, you know, I know how to make this work better so that the wires don't break and everything. So I put more, more, more oil on the machines. Well, come to find out, that wasn't the best idea because what happens after that is these cables are taken from these machines after they've braided the coax on them and then they're run through an extruder where they put the plastic cable covering. When you have a lot of oil left on the shielding, it causes bubbling and the, the plastic no longer adheres. And so it ruined thousands and thousands of feet of cable. And that's where I first learned that, you know, taking the initiative isn't always in your best interest. So after I was working on these cables, I worked long enough that I was able to get into their QA department. And in their QA department, I learned even more. And after spending a, about a year in QA, I was finally moved into R&D, where I am very proud to say that I was uh, an innovator on a number of patents for micro cable and connectors for medical ultrasound. I got tired of doing that and I wanted a different challenge. So I started looking around for new positions and I thought, you know, I have already been trained for software. And so I looked and became a uh, QA person for a telecom equipment manufacturer. This telecom equipment manufacturer uh, we, is where I first started learning about security. Number one, telecom equipment has to run seven nines. So 99.9999% of the time, no matter what happens, the data has to go through. Well, how does that happen when somebody pwns your equipment? Okay, so after being in QA for a while, I moved, decided I wanted to move into software engineering and I moved over and I started working on uh, an AAL1 uh, trans, packet trans. And what that does is it took in data from video cameras and it put it out in a constant bitrate stream which is actually, it sounds simple, but it was actually very difficult to do. And especially when we're talking about, this is like 1991, 92. After working and honing my software skills here, I was asked to go to work for a uh, telecom startup. This telecom startup, I was employee number 19 out of 200 engineers. I was responsible for doing the development for 56 port T1, 24 port E3, 
a 48 port E1, OC3 and OC12, and Stratum 3 clock drivers. Now, all of these work in the backbone of telecom. Once again, seven nines of reliability. After working on this, this is just about the time of the dot-com crash. And when that happened, we lost all of our funding. And of course, after a short amount of time, the company had to close. I was so afraid that my career was at an end because with the dot-com crash, nobody had any money. I was absolutely lucky that I got a job within 30 days working for a company that was doing developing uh, conferencing software that was based server-based and all of the clients logged into the servers. And so I became a full stack developer. I had never written anything at that level, at, at that higher level. I'd always been concerned with the lower level. But after a year, I was offered a position with another telecom company working on small, small office and home office routers. And this is where I really learned about security because we had to take and put those out on the internet live. And it was amazing to me the first time that I got through getting the software put in, set up, my router's running, everything's doing great, plug it into the internet, and 30 seconds later, it was dead. Dead. I could not even reboot it. It had been pwned in 30 seconds. So this shows that security is a huge, huge thing. And you cannot get away from the fact that no matter how hard you work on it by yourself, without having other people looking at it with you and working with you, you cannot possibly figure out everything on your own. After that, I finally went to work for Intel, which is where I'm at now, and I've been there for the last 15 years. I'm a product security expert in open source. I am currently uh, working with the BIOS and firmware team on strengthening our security processes around reporting and fixing uh, CVEs. And we're trying to drive this in at the open source level. I am the community manager for Tiano Core, and I'm also the community manager for universal scalable firmware. And by driving it in at the open source level, we can actually push this out to a number of our, uh, the people, the AMIs, the, uh, you know, AMDs, all of these, and, and push it in that way, rather than having everybody try to do something on their own. So being at Intel has taught me a lot. I not only work there, I kind of live there, but it taught me that I wanted to be able to give back to the community. So not only do I have my work life, I am also on the board of directors for Portland Women in Tech. I have been involved with them for almost six years now. When I first went to a Portland Women in Tech event, I walked in and there was no one like me. No one, and I was really concerned about that. It looked like a white girl's sorority party, to be honest. Um, I pulled the C COO aside and I said, I'm really concerned about this. You know, this isn't right. This isn't what we want our industry to look like. They took me seriously and they actually went out and got an external company to come in and, and give them direction on what they needed to do to diversify and make it better. I'm proud to say that after five years, it's probably one of the most diverse women's organizations I've ever worked with. 
and being on the board of directors makes me even happier. Well, I'm not only on the board of directors for Portland Women in Tech, I'm also on the staff of the Women Who Code Portland. And there we actually teach and run classes in everything from low level all the way up to full stack development, all the way up to you know, people who just want to learn how to code in Python. And this is another organization that I'm absolutely thrilled with the way that it works because it's all women driven, giving back to the community. And these are, there's no teachers, it's just women who have come together and put back into the community. Well, I, my, my work life and, and home life doesn't end there. I'm also on the board of directors for our local uh, fire district, which I live in a small rural community, very conservative. And I found out just two nights ago that I was voted in as the uh, new chair of the board of directors. I'm, thank you. I am the first woman on their board of directors and I am definitely the first woman <laughs> chair. So now that you've heard a little bit about me and you've seen how my career has gone, how it has progressed, it's had ups, it's had downs, and everybody's career is going to go through that too. But I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what taking the initiative really is when you're talking about your career, right? And it's probably not what you think it is. Sorry, a little brain dead here. Come forward, sign up, suggest, advance, propose, do on one's own volition, offer services, speak up, stand up, take the plunge. These all are in common with taking the initiative. However, some of these can hinder you in your career. And it's important that thoughts and ideas on how you can use your initiative uh, to reward yourself in your career without running into the pitfalls that I have run into personally in my career. So, how many of you in here have ever had somebody look at you and say, show some initiative? Right? How many of you have had a parent that said, why don't you show some initiative and insert chore of choice? <laughs> well, that they're asking you to do something, right, without being told to do it. And that works well in that atmosphere. It does not always work well when you're talking about this in relationship to your career. So, so you know, what type of initiation or initiative taking is good for your career? Let's consider you know, the initiative taking that I have used in my lifetime. I've gone through my career, I, I consider it, I've gone through three phases in my career. Phase one, early in my career, is I am right, I know I'm right, fight me. <laughs> and then we have the second phase, which is a probably around the middle of my career, which is I may be right, and you really should listen to me. And then the latter portion of my career, which is where I'm at now, is the, there are many right ways. Here are some of the ways that I researched and feel would be a good solution. So, category one, the I am right, 
I will die on this hill, right? I felt in this position was, I was the technical expert. I knew what I was doing. Other people around me, you can't possibly know what I know because I am the one who did this. I am the technical person. I did all of this on my own. That's not necessarily true. And I found that out very quickly, that many times you aren't the only one that knows what's supposed to be happening and that the technical aspects of it aren't always everything about the product or the object that you're working on. So, in category two, which is the you may be right, you know, you really should listen to me, right? I finally realized that I was not always 100% right and that there were other people that knew more than I did and that other people, even though they weren't doing the same technical work that I was doing, understood the bigger picture that I didn't understand. And then, of course, category three, we have the, uh, which is where I'm at now. Many times I've, I look and I reach out to people. I reach out to teams. I pull tiger teams together. And I talk to them about what do you think it will take to fix this? What do you think it will take to make this work? Don't you know, don't hesitate, just tell me, right? No, money's no object. If, if we could have whatever we wanted, what would it take to get it done? And by getting that and pulling in all of that information, you would be surprised how many times you'll get a lot of crossovers from people. And you'll see things and you'll look at directions that you never thought of. Getting that and putting it all together and coming up with something that is not necessarily 100% right, but is acceptable across the entire team. Because you can't always please everybody. And I guarantee you there's one thing for sure when you get 10 engineers into a room is you will never get consensus. Okay? And, and this is just a fact. Everybody's got their own ideas on how things should be done. And it's not that anybody's right or anybody's wrong. It's just that we all have different ideas. So by pulling everything together, getting everybody to agree, running through a number of different ways that something could be solved allows you to come up with something that may not be the perfect 100% way of fixing it, but is the one way that is acceptable to everyone and works for everybody. So this is where I want to talk to you about taking the initiative where it can actually hurt your career. So Sharon Kay uh, Parker and uh, Ying Wang have an article that was written on uh, Harvard Business Journal. And they talk about the proactive paradox. And that is where you go out and you become proactive and you do something that does not fall in line with what your manager is expecting or what your organization is expecting. So basically you're doing work that is either A, not necessary, or in some cases could actually cost money or cause problems for your manager or your organization. So being proactive takes a lot of work on your part to be able to sit there and look and say, should I really be doing this? You need to be able to go out and talk to team members, talk to them, find out, is this reasonable what I'm thinking? Because if you go off and just do something on your own, it's that same adage of where Friday night, get push, deploy, crash and burn. That is called a career limiting proactive choice. <laughs> and it's very easy to get caught up in all of this. So remember that 
being proactive does not mean running off and doing things on your own. It means taking the time to understand the situation, taking the time to reach out to others, taking the time to constructively criticize yourself as to what you're doing. So, Madeline Miles had a great list of 10 ways uh, of taking the initiative at work. And I really liked them when I read this. It was, it was really well thought out and done. And that is, you know, voice your, uh, voice, voice your ideas. Make sure that you reach out there and tell everyone. Be curious and keep learning, right? Find opportunities for improvement within your workplace. Address problems that you see. Step in when someone needs help, and this is a big one, right? Ask and learn. Offer help when training new employees. Make an effort to get to know your coworkers. Once again, networking, understanding the people that you work with. Ask for clarification when you're confused. And this is something that we all have one of the most difficult times doing. We don't like looking like we don't know what we're doing. But being confused is part of the human condition. Getting mixed signals. Did they really say this? Is, is this really what they want? I'm not so sure. Take the time and ask the question. You will be rewarded, I assure you. Always request constructive criticism. Because without criticism coming in from the outside, you will go off and keep running on thinking that the job I'm doing is just wonderful. And without people looking in at what you're doing and telling you, yeah, you really are doing, but have you thought about this? Right? Have you looked at it in this way? You won't make it as far. So as I looked at all 10 of these, and this is, you know, it, it's actually really well. I really liked it. But the problem was it wasn't easy to remember. And I wanted to leave you all with something today that hopefully you will you know, be able to think about for yourself. And that is taking the initiative first requires you to assess the situation. Because if you can't assess the situation, you're not going to be doing the right thing. Show some initiative and take the garbage out. Are you going to go take an empty garbage can out? Or are you going to say, oh, it's only half full. You know, it, it can go another day. Oh, it's really full. I need to take it out now. So assess the situation. Look at what needs to be done. Ask yourself, what does this need? The next thing you need to do is once you have assessed the situation is to strategize. Figure out what are the ways that we want to do said chore. There are many ways I can take the whole garbage can out or I can just take the plastic bag out. Why work more or work harder when you don't need to? Reach out to your team and work with your team to determine what is the best way to attack this problem. Because once you've finished assessing and strategizing, you can now knowingly proceed and work towards a solution. And by doing this, you can end up with this nice moniker, ask yourself, not others, ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Am I being proactive?
proactive am I taking the initiative of doing what the team needs? So now, before I end here, did anybody read my first slide? How many years have I been in the tech industry? 35? So, we're, we're testing. So how many of you here have, uh, this is your first Diana initiative? Wow, this is really impressive. Well, I would like you all to have one of our coins from 2019 to take with you. So when I finish here in just a minute, I have you all come up, I've got challenge coins. But for the person who said I've been in 35 years first, who was the first? I have a I have a special one for you. Um, I'm I'm very I'm known as being very irreverent, and uh, I have a number. I I say the F word a lot. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I am not going to say it. I just said I say the F word a lot, and I have some F word pins that I have made every year <laughs> that are basically zero F words. But for the person who uh, gave the 35 years, I will give you a special coin that it's the last one of its type, which is a zero F words coin. And so uh, being here has been absolutely excellent. I really don't want to keep you all here uh, too much longer. And uh, with that, I really want to say thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for staying. And thank you very much for making Diane Initiative what it is.